So when you're trying to pull information from data, I just love this cartoon talking about trying to find a needle in a haystack of large data. Um, there are challenges as we work with larger and larger data sets. Um, and that's exciting. Com computers allow you to very quickly um, process unbelievable amounts of data that you never could have imagined processing before computers. Um, so there are opportunities and challenges for, for, for doing that. The opportunities are, wow, you can extract things you never could have before, but the challenges are it's really hard to do that. That's kind of the piece of that. Um, identifying trends, we talked about trying to find clusterings, and trends are important. Making connections between pieces of data is important. Um, you, once you have data more than you know, 1,000 ish, 2,000 ish, you certainly need a lot of help from computers. You can't just manually do that. And in the past, people have done manual, manual processing of data, and they were able to do it because the data was small. We were sampling our city or our community or our county, and we all, you know, what kind of uh, apple do you want this me to grow in my farm? And so we all surveyed the 100 people in my county. That's not the same thing as asking the country, what would you prefer in a candidate that says this and this, and then processing that. You certainly need a computer to do that processing. And for, with the goal of efficiently finding, recognizing patterns and discovering information, um, search tools are critical, right? As it's out there, we've known the value of search in, in, with, the web, with web content. You know, I, it's out there. Somebody's got an amazing uh, page on cat videos. I've got to find it. If I don't have a good search tool, I'm not going to find it. It's out there, but I can't find it. So searching is important to finding needles out of the haystack. That's critical, obviously. Um, information filtering is a way, if you imagine you get a ton of email, uh, and many now email clients allow you to have information filtering where you can say, only show me the email from important people that has come in the last week, blah, blah, blah. Those are ways of filtering all this mail that you've probably done. You've probably used these filtering tools in your own email. It's important when you have big data. Now I have a ton of data filtered by the people who are going to vote, because that's the people I need to get to, people who are needing water the most, and you can then filter that to get to the answer you want. So filtering is critical in terms of that. And software tools such as spreadsheets and databases can certainly help in the process. And you know that, but it's really nice to be able to see grid uh, data in tables. That's really great. And then th often these tools allow you to have visualizations as well, kind of automatic. I can take this graph, and as the numbers are populating it, a graph is updating and wiggling as who needs the water and who is getting the water is kind of sh coming out of me because of visualization. So tools like spreadsheets and databases. Databases are used to hold the data, and software tools such as spreadsheets and other tools. Uh, MATLAB is another tool to play with big data. Um, R is a, is a statistical package to work with and massage big data. So these tools are all helpful in terms of working with them. The concerns, well, it's not a, you know, they said there's some challenges. Opportunities are, wow, you can discover all this cool stuff you couldn't before, but there are a lot of challenges, and so a lot of bullets here. So large data sets, let's just talk about what the word large data and big data mean. It includes, large data has been d used by the financial industry and by the kind of corporate industry for years and years and years before we thought of big data. They'll say Visa. Uh, my uncle worked for Visa many, many years ago, and this is like, I, I remember him coming to a family holiday, and he was working on his project. What's your project? Well, I just got all the transaction records from you know, Visa customers from a thing, and then he was able to log in and get that securely, but he's able to poke and work with that. This is like 20 years ago. He was working with all the, all the purchase data of, of Visa card customers and figure out you know, who buys what when and connecting them together and uh, maybe even helping stores place in Safeway. They, you have these Safeway cards so they can know um, who bought what at what time and how to place things on shelves, all that's driven by big data. It's incredible how much big data drives where locations are in stores. How many things are kind of impulse buys? They're by the checkout counter. They know that by the fact that they tried this one and it didn't sell. They tried this one and that did sell, so they keep that by the counter so they can make more purchases. Really, you know, Gum does very well by the counter, right? You put gum in the back, nobody buys gum. You put gum by the counter, it's that kind of an impulse purchase. They've learned that by the big data analysis they've done. Okay? Um, when you've got big data sets, is really hard. We're going to mention this a couple times. But storing it is hard, processing is hard, and curating. Like, how do you actually have people reveal it and, and, and make it available to other folks? Securing it is really hard as well. Structuring it. How do I make it easy to search? Is it, is it just a big Excel chart? Is it just a big text file? How do you structure it to allow for easy queries, easy search of that? That's also difficult. Um, boy, maintaining privacy. This is a critical thing. Once you have the ability, and I think Gerald talked about this in his lecture last time, um, if you have lots of different data sources, you think they're independent, but because they're so big, I can now cross-correlate them and figure out who you are. So he was able to show work where he cross-correlated uh, Yelp reviews with um, check-in to Foursquare and check-in other things. So all of a sudden, I thought these were independent accounts, and one of them has my name, this one has my address, this one has something else, but because 
the computers were able to figure out that that's the same person. Now all of a sudden that person knows my name, my address, all those things, because they were able to cross correlate them and my picture or something, because I put my picture there, my address here, my name there, and they figure out it's all the same person. Now they have all that, right? So that's, a, that's an issue. And pri trying to um, keep, trying to de-anonymize data is a really, really almost impossible task. People have done this. Well-meaning people have revealed data to say, hey, you, here's some data you can now use it to, uh, there was some case in Massachusetts where they revealed data, you read this from Blown to Bits, they revealed some data and people were able to de-anonymize it and find out all these things because people are so rare. You find somebody with high income who lives there who has this number of kids, that's the governor. Or, you know, you can actually de-anonymize things very easily, even though I try to strip all that stuff away and just have an ID number for your name and no address, but you can figure out based on tax records, based on lots of other public sources, who, you know, per house purchases, who people are. So, Maintaining privacy is a critical thing. We talked about that as I get into the last lecture. Scalability of systems is important when data sets are large. So you've got a really big data set. If you're going to try to build a system that works on that data set, well, what, hap what happens when that data set now triples in size? Ten times, a thousand times. You, you have to have a system in place, hardware and software, that will scale to handle the size of data that you often get. Oh, I've got a great algorithm. Okay, what is it? Well, it works really well for ten data, ten, ten data objects. Okay, how does it work for ten million? Not so well, okay? That's an issue. You have to have algorithms and hardware and software that do scale successfully to make it work for big data. Um, and the size and the scale of a system that stores data affects how it's being used. Well, I have a system that works really, really, really fast for small data, but really slow for big data, okay? So that means I can take a huge data file, like a movie file, and put it on your system because you can't handle large data on your system. So the size and scale affects how it's being used as well. Um, and analytical, analytical techniques such as to, to store, manage, and transmit change as the size of data changes. So when I have small data, I can do things cheap and dirty, and the algorithm can be really bad. But as the data size grows, I better be really efficient, really fast, low latency, high bandwidth, the things we talked about in this class before. Those better be true for a big data source that's far away. Okay, so that's important. As a, as a great example, uh, Amazon Web Services allows you to upload their data to them and they charge you for the upload cost. And you know what they found it's easy to do? They and users have found it's easy to do? Put your data on a hard drive and ship, ship it to FedEx. It's actually easier to ship like a ton of that, like terabytes of data, we'll learn what that means in a moment, but a ton of data, it's actually easier to ship them hard drives than it is to actually plug your computer into the wet net and try to pump it through the wire, okay? Isn't that crazy? So if you had a lot of data, shipping hard drives is actually faster. Isn't that incredible? So it's certainly, uh, Techniques for managing and transmitting changes the size of data changes. You know, you can upload a little bit, but once the data gets too big, you have to change your model. You have to now ship them a hard drive instead of trying to stream it up there. 